Welcome back to the Tech World Servers podcast. We're lucky enough this week to be joined by owner and founder of Ontaro, Tony Paskin. Hello. And the ever-present head of data and strategy, Patrick Murray. Hello. Now, starting with you then, Tony, can you provide a brief sort of introduction to Ontaro? What does it do? Yes. Um, Ontaro was developed, uh, which is an online child protection, to help uh, parents monitor the children's uh, online activity through their mobile device. Excellent. And so how does it work then? What's it, what's it actually do? What's it integrated with? Um, well, we, we've used um, AI to um, actually monitor the, the, the language and the conversations what children uh, are having uh, online. Uh, we're using apps and um, well, over a, a certain amount of categories, it um, will alert a parent of any dangers that um, are apparent and so they then can um, talk to the child about it. So it's really a conversation started between parent and child, it enables that conversation? That's right, yes, it is, yes. Oh, fantastic. And what was the sort of motivation behind um, developing this app? Um, unfortunately, I had um, the uh, experience of, of, of someone uh, actually committing suicide and um, when we started looking through their social activity uh, or their online activity, we could see that they'd been self-harming, going on self-harming sites and then ultimately uh, committing suicide. And I just felt we, we were, you were never in the, in the loop with a, a child's um, activity in life. They're, they're, they're so busy, um, and, and as an adult we're so busy, that we needed some kind of early warning system. And so uh, Ontario was born from that, really. Fantastic. Yeah, so obviously the hope that um, prevent is a preventative measure for future things such as that then? I think Ontario is not a, a substitute for openness and communication with a parent. Mm. Um, it's there to encourage that. Mm. Um, you're not spying on the child. Um, you, you tell the child you put, you, you put it on the phone. I mean, a lot of parents give the child the phone and tell them they want to take that phone back off them and check it and look, look through it. Mm. Well, as a child of 13, that's a, a, a breach of the privacy rights because a child of 13 has the same privacy rights as an adult. And so you're not encouraging the child, you're pushing the child away. Whereas on Taro, uh, you put this on the child's phone and you can tell the child, I don't need to look at your phone. And so it, it oh, creates an openness and brings you closer mm. and encourages you to talk to your child. So it's sort of striking the balance between protecting the child online and respecting their privacy rights as well. That's right, yes, yes. Very good. Um, so in, in your opinion, what, what does the role of education play with um, sort of protecting children online as well? Um, I think edu education is the point they've got the access to children with schools and that to, to uh, educate them on on everything there is about on, online and the dangers. Um, the, 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 I think the on, online bill is, is, is trying to encourage things, um, but I don't know if it goes far enough. It's just information and knowledge, uh, and children are so apt at learning, they're, they're programmed to learn. Mm -hmm. So we just need some time to encourage them. I know they're in, trying to encourage um, schools uh, a curriculum about um, suicide and mental health, uh, which is good, but um, I think it needs to go further. Children today, we've never been in such a, um, a position. We learn from as parents, parents mm. but this has never been, you know, social media and the online activity and everything is so big. It's, it's, it's a first. Mm. It must be difficult for parents. I mean, we I guess we come from a generation where social media was sort of just starting out when we were at school. I mean, I remember having, you know, a MySpace account, which felt a lot different to the kind of social media you get nowadays. But to some extent, we were, we were sort of, we were still raised using that kind of tech, but I don't think it was quite as pervasive into every part of our lives as maybe it is nowadays. Um, but I'll say one of, one of the things I like about learning about Ontario, I can imagine there's a lot of, parents who didn't have you know this is quite a new world to them as well mm -hmm. and they maybe don't even know even if they did have that insight themselves would they know what to look out for you know do they know what kind of sites that, that kids can do and what kind of things they can access you know by having an instagram account and you know tools like ontaro and ai tools in general you know it's, it's almost a way of bottling up that experience mm. and, and and putting it in an app 
and uh, you know, n not only are you not prying, but you, you you can be confident that there's something there that, that does know yeah. that, that can help. So you're right. The, the physical the physical dangers as as a parent was your child going outside mm. and being exposed to to the world uh, or, or to to the locality of uh, a predator or, or some nasty person mm. or something like that. But what we've done is we've gave them an exposure and access to the world in the pocket. Yeah. And there's there's all those people and or, or all the, the negative and nasty side of it that the child may not see mm. or be exposed because it's like uh I think it's the word anonymity that that people don't don't take responsibility for their actions and it's scary. Uh the online is 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 scary and parents we can't. We just can't leave it for the government and people to take action to protect. You've got to do it yourself. And um, mm. this is one of the things I've hopefully Ontario will give parents a tool to to do that. Mm. Fantastic. Just uh, <clears throat> going back to something that you mentioned there, Patrick. Um, I don't know something that the viewers will want to know. Um, the MySpace account is that still active? It's not. Well, I actually went looking for it recently. Um, I, w I wanted to kind of relive some of my old hairdos. Uh, and see what that was like, but you know, MySpace back then, you know, in social media in general. I mean, what was MySpace account? You messed around with a bit of HTML, you put a song that you thought was really cool on, and that was almost as far as it went. And it feels like now in the days of Facebook, where it's you know, it became a lot more photo conscious. Everyone was judging everyone. It became about likes. It became about commenting on people. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like we saw that, but thankfully, I'm, I'm glad Facebook came in a little bit later. I think for us. So, uh, well, so we'll drop the link in the uh, in, in the comment section. Yeah, yeah, for so subscribe, yeah, yeah. Okay, just for yourself. So just stepping in on on the social media side of things, um, it's it's the difference when 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 uh, you're younger and you say you 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 had you fell over at school or or um, did a funny face when you were yawning. Uh, the only people that saw it were in your vicinity. Mm -hmm. Now somebody catches it on a phone. And it's it's all over mm. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and and you really you can be ridiculed of that, and so you can't children just can't get away from that kind of thing. It's not localized anymore, mm. and that's the, that's the difference I think as well. Yeah. So how can um, parents and guardians um, best make use of the functions on the app to increase its effectiveness of safeguarding? Um, well, well, the the Ontario will alert you of any concerns. Uh, through the different categories that we have, and um, you will, you, they go onto their dashboard. A, they have a dashboard, and it, it will give them the alert, and it'll give them a snippet of the te of the, the word in what is alert and concern, and it will give them um, a, a percentage or a degree of how serious we think it is, and then they can take the action of whether it is serious or, or whether it's not, and then they can help us. Uh, they can help Ontario. Uh, learn and grow as well by choosing whether it's it is or it isn't serious uh, we also provide um, access to um, charities where they can get help and look so we don't just leave them where we're giving the work you know that there's a concern and that's it we, we also direct them where they can um, get advice on help to start a conversation with the child and so that also helps we don't just leave them in the lurch with that we encourage them to look at these char charity sites and get the help that they need to talk about it. And where can people find it then? Where can they, you mentioned it's on the, uh, the Android. Yeah, it's, uh, if you go on, online, uh, www.ontaro.co.uk, um, you'll find that there. There's a lot of information that you can uh, read that'll help you. And then you can click on the, um, the link to, to open it and that will take you to a, a page where you can subscribe. You get 14 days free trial um, so there's no uh, nothing, no cost to try it, um, but yeah, it, it's it's um, it's something that's there to be able to try for free. How did uh, how did Razor help you on your journey then, Tony, towards building Ontario? Well, um, from my, from my first idea of of, of what I wanted, um, it took me quite a long time to even find anybody uh, that could actually understand what I was wanted to achieve. And I, I found Razor on my doorstep, virtually. Uh, 
and from my first contact, two weeks later, um, I got such a fantastic um, reply, a, a report of, of what I didn't expect, uh, which gave me so much confidence that I'd found the right people there and gave me enough uh, to move forward with them and, and to the next stage. Um, and so, it, it, yeah, I, I, I feel quite lucky that I actually, I mean, although it took me quite a while, lucky to find Razor and the steps that we went through um, to get where we are today. Um, it's been, I've been lucky, I think, um, to have found Razor and, and such a, a company that can, that's achieved uh, everything we've wanted, we've set out to achieve and gone further, really. Uh, where we are talking about AI, okay. I think data is a very important thing and I've learned a lot about that, uh, data mining and scraping and, and all that. So it's uh, it's been fantastic, but Riz has really stepped up the mark and, and, and blown it out of the out of the water. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, what advice would you give um, any, any sort of new businesses or current businesses who are looking to adopt AI? Um, I would, I would, Encouraged to, to embrace the AI, it, it's, it's, it's going to be here. Um, if, if you can identify that it will help you, then um, yes, definitely. Um, I think, I think it's, 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 it's improving all the time and um, AI is, is, it will be a fantastic uh, aid as long as we, you know, we use it like that. And uh, I think, yeah, I think the, the governments are, are control, you know, realise it. And I think there's a lot of scaremongery about how serious it can be and what it can do. And I, I, I think it can be. It's great that they are looking at um, controlling it or looking how serious it can be because they neglected that when they uh, first provided the internet and online. And that's why we're in a, a position we are with online because it wasn't uh, policed or implemented correctly, whereas they are doing this with AI. But AI, is, I think, is, is fantastic. It's um, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I think I think it's good in a lot of ways. How we can use it is at the minute. I think people are becoming. You know, it's important for for the public and for people to be aware about you know what is possible with it. Having awareness that, especially with things like gener generative AI, I come again. <laughs> AI that helps you create things um, with things like images. Yes, it's changing. The, you know, we, we saw not that long ago those pictures of when Donald there were rumors of Donald Trump getting arrested, and there were all those yeah, pictures yes, doing the, doing the, the rounds. Thing, yes, yeah. It's important people are aware that you almost can't trust everything like that. You need to question it. I think people are becoming more aware of the value of their own data off the back of it. You know, a lot of these algorithms that, that we that we see, you know, AI's AI has been around for, for decades in one form yes. or another, mm -hmm. but we're seeing it. Um, Companies like Netflix, Amazon, and we talked about it on the previous podcast, you're using that data to recommend things to you. That's not done by accident. That's done by collecting people's data. I think people are becoming more and more aware of that value. And um, it's going to be an interesting, interesting few decades, I think, coming up mm. for that. So, And do you think organisations are ready for AI? Uh, I, I think it depends how you frame AI. I think um, one of the great things about tools like, like ChatGPT that we're seeing in... Mm -hmm. um, even with image recognition, that there are tools that you see through um, through Microsoft, like through their cognitive services, where actually you can get a lot of functionality out of the box. You don't always have to start with just your own with your own data set. Um, when you're using things like language models, there's more and more opportunity for, for organisations to start from, from you know, build on the shoulders of giants, as it were. Mm -hmm. I think um, we've seen with with data in general to to, to do AI for say your own your own purposes to, to train something from scratch. Generally, you need quite a lot of data. Mm, and I think yes. it's, it's coming at a, at a point now where companies are more aware of that in general and are likely to be sat on, on, on more yes. data and yes. use it more. Mm. Um, but I think in, in, in that regard, companies need to walk before they, they run with, with AI and, and focus on, okay, how can we use data? How can we use, um, if we get data in the right people's hands to empower them, um, maybe the AI can come next and make that even better as, as the next stage. So. Um, I think there's lots of opportunities for organisations to start using AI, but I think starting with the data, they can enable more and more things. So you're talking about walking before you run. Is that the logical first step then? 
Yeah, that's, that's the first step. I mean, something that we, we talk about and one of the services that we offer is our, is our edge to cloud offering. I think, um, which, which is aimed particularly at manufacturers where they've started collecting data. They may be um, you know, hung up on keeping that on premise and using that for um, and not letting that leave their site. But I think more and more manufacturers, and when we're out there talking to them, are starting to be aware of, well, if we move this into, into a secure cloud, it actually unlocks a lot of possibilities to use things like, like AI yeah. to, to, to look into that next level of what trends can we uncover? Um, how can we um, you know, build this into the applications that we use to you know, streamline uh, you know, our manufacturing processes? And uh, I, think, I think that's a step that a lot of organizations are gonna have to take to unlock this kind of technology. Do you think, do you think that AI is used as an umbrella of, of, of a lot of... Oh, so AI, I mean, AI has been around for decades. Yes. You know, AI is anything where a computer is seeming to take some intelligence data. Yeah, so it's data. The, yeah, so it's based on some data. It's, 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 data. Yes. it's information on data comes in. Yes. There appears to be a logical step and then something has happened. Yeah. Now that could be an if statement. AI could be an if statement, but that is that is about as narrow as you can get for AI. And that is you know, one very very particular question, taking some data in. If this, then that. You know that that is a, that is AI. Yeah. What we're seeing now, though, is this sort of next level. You know, when we see things like ChatGPT and these huge language yes. models yeah. that seem to be doing, um, you know, a lot more com a lot more complicated uh, actions and making much more complicated decisions. But really, that is still quite narrow. You know, chat GPT isn't going to drive a car. You know, self-driving car technology is becoming more and more common. You know, it, it, it's possible. You know, Teslas can pretty much do that now. Yeah. What's holding it up is um, is laws, basically. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, it's, it's something that's going to hold up AI. It's a bit of a blocker for it at the minute, where AI is almost held to a different standard to humans. Yes. If... A uh, self-driving car takes a million journeys and crashes on one of them. Yeah. People will say, oh, it's not safe. Self-driving cars, not safe. Humans crash all the time, all the time. And it's, is, is there an argument to say, you know, is there a threshold that isn't zero where we say, actually, AI is making us safer? Of course it's got difficulties. I mean, you hear a lot, people talk on social media around self-driving cars of, oh, if it was in crashing and you know there was an old lady over here or a, a, you know, a group of kids over here, what what would it pick to, to drive into? Right. Humans aren't held to that standard, um, so I think th th there's a there's a uh, an argument to be had there of when when do we say AI is safe enough? Um, in fact, we were having this discussion recently with one of our um, one of the products that we're developing around uh, using ChatGPT to. Um, extract information from documents. So I used to work in the nuclear industry before um, oh, okay. working at Razor. And that is an industry with a lot of documentation. I wish you'd have told me that before I sat next to you. I said, yeah, that's, this is what the glow is. I'm not sure what's happening to the cameras anymore. Um, but there's an application with that where in, a, in an environment where there's a huge amount of documentation in, in the regulatory world, using tools, using language models to interrogate those documents, oh. answer questions. So what becomes going through page after page yes. becomes asking a question. Right. Now, I wouldn't have AI right now just deciding what is safe for a nuclear power plant. However, that kind of tool in the hands of someone who already is experienced and knows yeah. can make them more effective. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the point that we're at now with AI, is making people more effective through building these tools to help them, not just putting AI in the driving seat. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a replacement for people no. And their interactions and their work is something to enhance their work. It's something to enhance people. I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, over the next century, more and more things are going to be automated. That's always been the case. You know, when the, when the combine harvester came along, that automated and you know, replaced people. Yeah. And I think there's a, as a society, there's a lot of questions that need to be asked about, you know, what does that economy look like in 50 years, 100 years' time? Uh -huh. um, mm. But right now, where we are, it's there to make people better. You can't re always replace that human element. It's what can computers do better than humans? Put that in the power of the mm -hmm. humans doing the stuff that they do better. Um, so information and technology are all, always, uh, when, when you, once you gain that information, it's empowering. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I think this makes it more efficient to find that information. Yes, yeah. Yeah, in my day I used to go to the library. Yeah, yeah. What language? Yeah. <laughs>
I felt one cup. Yeah, and that, now, that, now the information's in, in, in your hand. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and you, you hit on the thing about crashes. You know, the, the car was a great invention, mm -hmm. uh, but they very quickly learned that um, it, it crashes happened and people died, and, and so they started looking at ways to improve it, mm -hmm. you know, which was seat belts, um, airbags, and lane assist, and, all, and, and the same with uh, Ontario. Um, when children go online, they mm -hmm. um, they're exposed, but we we need to make it safer. And mm -hmm. so, really, a child goes online. That's an, an online journey. Well, put a seatbelt on it with Ontario. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So, brilliant. Um, and how far how far is this going to go? Then we hear things like computer vision. Can you sort of give us a, a brief summary of what that means? So, computer vision is um, computers are very very good at looking for patterns, looking for trends. And in a lot of cases, when you're looking at an image, you know, we do that as humans, we're identifying mm -hmm. something. When did that thing occur? Is that thing different to how it, how it normally is? That, that, that pattern understanding is, is a great computer application. And that's basically what computer vision is. Um, it can take lots of different forms. So obviously we do a lot of work in the manufacturing world where um, things like uh, identifying defects, if, 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 there's a, um, if you know, someone's produced a you know, steel component and you're looking for where, where does that not? Um, you know, where are the issues that the last oh. two thousand pieces didn't have that? Right, yeah. Looking for that kind of thing. Um, we have a lot of conversations with things like the textile industry. Obviously, that's a big industry in Yorkshire, mm -hmm. um, and where in a, in a lot of cases when the, you know, the materials coming through, it's still very manual, very human focused to look for. Okay, where does that? Mm -hmm. I imagine after a six hour shift and you're yeah. two coming past yeah. it, you're not seeing those yes. all those defects. Computer vision and, and the, the, the products that we develop in for computer vision are for identifying those um, automatically mm -hmm. and doing that. Um, so I think that's something, again, particularly in the manufacturing world, where an industry where we rely on sensors to measure things like temperature, vibration, yeah. easy, easy peasy. But now where it comes down to, and you might have seen a post we put on LinkedIn quite recently uh, around counting, you know, when, 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 there's a, when there's an action that's happening over and over again, you can just point a camera at it and, 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 and count something happening. You can see things going on that otherwise it would be very difficult to monitor with a sensor. Um, and I think that's something that's going to be a really, it's becoming a huge thing in manufacturing. And again, is enabled by getting on the cloud, getting data on the cloud and using that um, computing power on tap right. um, to adopt that more and more. And that's something that we're seeing a lot, um, which is very exciting. And how can, um, you sort of touched on a few things there, how can sort of speech and uh, gesture recognition also be used as a tool in the same sort of way? Well, yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> I mean, if you see anything that we put out, any, anything that we build at Razor, one of the first things that we're always considering is that human interaction with technology. Now, just the nature of the, of the stuff that we build, typically that will be a, you know, a user interface on a, on, a, on a screen that has to be designed you know, for usability. But what we're finding is, as we're working in these industries where actually the people using our software uh, are operating something else, they're operating a piece of machinery, you know, they need the concentration somewhere mm -hmm. else. If you were driving a car, it's very difficult to drop that to go over here to, to interact with, you know, a device. So that's where we're using things like voice um, recognition, uh, oh, right. gestures, where people can continue what they're doing, but they can interact with, with, with technology you know, using their voice and they, and they can still get that benefit that, that enables them to do their job better without having to stop the thing that requires their attention. Um, that's a big application. I use Alexa for that. Well, Alexa, that's a great one. Yeah. And yeah, I think a lot of us who particularly have a, have a Northern accent remember a time where voice recognition was didn't really work very well for us. Yes. Um, you know, and, and we all struggle with that. And that was something that this really seems to have improved in, in recent years and has become a lot more accessible. Mm. Um, and I think that speaks to a lot of the, a lot of the ethical issues that you get with, with, with AI and, and making sure it does work for everyone. Yeah. It well, so. I still struggle to understand some of the things that you're saying, but I think I caught the, sort of most of that. Yeah, yeah, we can slow down some Yeah, exactly. Pitch shift it. Yeah. <laughs> good, good stuff, yeah. Just touching on something you said earlier about generative AI, how can that be used um, across industry? And what, what are the benefits of that? What does it really mean? Well, I'm not going to try and say it again. I think you did a good job of saying it. Um, but it's, to, say, to say the very least, it, it's naturally one of those 
applications of AI that's probably become the biggest in, in the media that's being picked up a lot. You know, we saw things like Dali, if, if you remember that time where we, with images getting generated, we touched on the thing with um, with the Donald Trump yeah. photos mm -hmm. and, and creating that kind of, uh, you know, artwork. It's opened up a bit of a minefield for, for copyright. You know, who, who owns what? what does it, if, if something's trained on an artist's images and produces another one, you know, who owns that and that kind of thing. Oh. Where I think it, it is a little bit safer at the minute and where we're seeing applications in industry are things like, you know, writing the hundredth version of a document that you've already written. I mean, we write a lot of documents um, and using things like uh, you know, text generation to, 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 I guess, fill in that manual effort yeah. where eight, the 80% of the document is the same as every time, every other time and let you focus on, on, on the interesting bits. Um, again, linking, linking back to the application I said of the nuclear industry, you know, we work with a few organizations who have a body of, of, um, of, of work, of documents, that they've created over years, it's very hard to know what's in them. Having that AI that's trained on that can not just write new documents, but answer those questions. It can, you know, oh, right, you yes. can interact mm. with them in a very natural language way that's a little bit more intuitive than the, the typical sort of search box that we used to. Um, so again, take, taking away that waste of people's time trolling through things when they, should, when they could be doing other things is an exciting one. Um, and you know, replacing all our designers as well. Let's not forget that. I think if it's if, if it's implemented helpfully, then maybe it can help us to reduce us working week. Mm. Uh, but you know, not just reduce the, the salary, but encourage enough so that you say it makes us more efficient. But we, we it helps humans to well reduce us. You know, so we don't have to work. After well, I mean, it's interesting because I, I recently read a book called um, Utopia for Realists. If you come, I can't remember the, the name of the author. Um, I can add that. Put it, put it in the comment section. Yeah, down the yeah. bottom, yeah. We can add it in there. Next to your MySpace. There you go. We've got it on there. Yeah. Um, which talks a lot about that. The, the, uh, AI is, there's, there's not just the ethics of AI itself. It's opened up all these discussions of things like universe, universal basic income. Yeah. Um, I mentioned before about... Uh, things like combine harvesters. There was a, a huge percentage of the people in this country worked in farming before the automation came mm -hmm. in. But what happened when, automa when, when that came in is uh, different industries popped up and, and people moved to that. So actually generally, the, 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 the output of you know, production in this country and jobs has pretty much gone hand in hand mm -hmm. until recently. And we're starting to see more and more as things get automated and, and as AI comes in, we're starting to see that decoupling of those two things, right. where production is continuing to go up in a lot of industries, but the jobs are starting to reduce. And I think that's where we start to get into these conversations about short working weeks. Yes, yeah. Things like universal basic income. Yes. Because what I'd what I, what I hate to see happen with AI is that we have all these tools now for generating artwork. Yeah. That's what we should be freeing humans to do. It should be human, because that's what we're great at. Yes, yeah. Artwork, mm. creating music. Um, you know, we've all seen your SoundCloud and uh, some, of the things, is. some of the things on that. Go a link to that. Um, so it's, it's, it's opened up a lot of interesting conversation in that space. So I recommend that book, Utopia for Realists. I really recommend that book for, the, for that kind of thinking. I suppose it's all talking about making our lives easier, mm. making, making the human superhuman, mm -hmm. and really sort of creating a more efficient working structure. Speaking of which, um, I told ChatGPT that you were coming on today. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So to save me, you know, thinking of questions and stuff, I just asked, what would you ask Patrick Murray, head of strategy and data? Okay. And this, is, this is the question. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the most interesting insights or discoveries you've encountered whilst working with data or AI? Oh, good question. Can't take credit for accent, but yeah. I think um, one of the great things of it, that, that I've seen when working with data is it's often not it doesn't always have to be some huge breakthrough when you when you when you when you collect the data it's, it's not always this huge aha moment that we're going to change things completely it doesn't always have to be we're working with a um a, a steel manufacturer in, in sheffield who started picking up you know using their own data and starting to collect more of it to, to look for insight and one of the things that they found was on their um where, when they're melting their, their steel and they're closing the door of their um, 
where, where they're heating it up. What they found was, we are measuring the, the temperature, that they weren't quite closing the door the whole way. They were seeing that there was a big temperature difference, a huge drop off down right down by the door, just through, through putting these simple through temperature um, sensors in, or thermometers, as I call them. But what that meant was a very simple change of make sure that that door shut every time. Because you can imagine now the amount of electricity that goes into that yeah, kind of yes, application, yeah. the, amount, the amount of energy that they have to pay for. Yeah. Being able to knock a few percentage points off that over the course of a year actually resulted in a huge impact in the, in the money they were saving. So while it's not always a huge, exciting difference, those small things can actually make a very big impact, even though they seem quite boring. So that would be my answer to you. Doesn't have to be exciting. No, I don't think you can underestimate that. Actually. No, um, it could be. It could change the, the actual structure of the, the metal that you're heating up or melting. Yeah. Down. So it's yeah, it's quite interesting. That. That's it. Yeah. And is there is there anything that we can do in, in sort of that space where we're getting these insights, we're able to take action, and we're actually be able to optimize, um, you know, processes for for certain companies. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what we do. And and the first step is always. It's very hard to improve things that you're not measuring. And that's one of the great things with getting started with, with, with IoT. Um, that's one of the things that we're going with our Edge to Cloud offering, or with Razor Edge. Um, it's just getting people starting to measure these things, starting to look at them, starting to make it part of their workflow when they're, when they're planning things, and seeing what drops out. Because they often, you know, you can imagine with that application that, that I talked about, it didn't take very long, it, it didn't take many times making sure that door was shut for that little project to pay for itself yes. many, many times over. And a lot of the conversations that I'm having in industry, when you know, we go to events and, and we speak to manufacturers, you talk digital transformation and they go, oh, God, you know, we've got other things to be spending our money on, particularly at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's a huge thing. That's something that we'll work on over the next 10 years. But it doesn't always have to be that huge thing. Mm -hmm. Projects like that are the perfect place to start. It's that start small, start with a... You know, look, look for a high impact place to begin and then you can start moving on to doing mm. different things. And I'd say that's where everyone needs to be starting. Don't always worry about huge digital transformation. Think what are the problems we're having and how can we put these solutions in to start improving things. Patrick, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And thank you ChatGPT for that question. Yeah, no, uh, there's, there's a few more if you want to... <laughs> well, I'll catch you. Yeah, I'll speak after. Yeah, yeah. How can... Um, how can data be used to optimise processes for organisations? Um, it's one of the, obviously, areas that we work in is in logistics. Um, we work with a big uh, freight company in the UK. Um, and, and going back to what I said before about looking for different, rather than trying to do an all-in-one digital transformation, look for opportunities to find efficiencies. Obviously, data-driven um, tools was, was a big part of that whether it was um, looking for uh, you know, ways to com combine different trains and, and save money that way. But by building, we actually developed an optimizer using the data that they had on the different routes and, and, and their schedule. And managed to identify, you could almost reduce, you could reduce the, uh, the whole fleet of their trains by about 9% because there were so many inefficiencies that we found in it. And by collecting that data and, and combining it from different sources. So one of the things that, that, that we build um, is a data warehouse where you can pull in data from lots of different sources and build up that more complete picture of what's going on in your organisation to find those different efficiencies and find opportunities where maybe those two bits of data wouldn't have come together otherwise. And so there's a lot of opportunities there with organisations. Well, Tony, Patrick, it's been great to have you on. Thanks very much. Thank you. And thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>